Okay. Number 55, tariffs are different from assigned import quotas and that tariffs will. Remember the graphs we did on domestic supply, world supply, all that stuff? So um, tariffs are taxes, quotas are a number of items that are allowed into the country or not. So tariffs make money, so they generate revenue. Quotas do not make any money. They're just a way of controlling trade. Say, well, you can only you know, import nine Bugatti Veyrons or something this year, whatever it is. All right, so that one easy. Everybody got that one? Remember that stuff? Okay, good. All right, 56, in the narrowest definition of money, M1, remember we narrow the money supply down to its components, M1 and M2 and M3, okay? M1 savings accounts are excluded because they are, they're different than checking accounts, aren't they? Okay, savings accounts can have time limits on them where you can't touch it for a year if you get higher interest rates, stuff like that, okay? Savings accounts are also not a medium of exchange. So you can't just go spend your savings account. You have to take the money out first, don't you? Okay, so M1 is different because it is a medium of exchange. It's cash and coins. That's the largest component and it's the most narrow, okay? And it widens out as you get things over time and whatever else, okay? So A, you guys got that right? Good, okay, awesome. Okay, 57, this one looks a little ugly, but it's not that bad. For which of the following sets of unemployment and inflation rates will a central bank, remember that's the Fed, be most reluctant to increase the rate of growth in the money supply? All right, so take your time with the wording of these. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at these unemployment and inflation rates and which one of these situations would make them not want to increase the money supply. So increasing the money supply does what for interest rates? It's expansionary, isn't it? Okay. So, if which one of these is going to make the Federal Reserve Bank not want to do something expansionary? Okay. So if they do something expansionary, what does it cause? What's our side effect? Expansionary means make the economy go, correct? Okay. It lowers unemployment, but it causes inflation. So down here, we want to do something expansionary because we want to get to a certain level of unemployment, right? We want to help things. So if we're at five percent unemployment and 5% inflation, then they can do something expansionary. But if we're at 5% unemployment and 10% inflation, that's the most dangerous one. So I would look at inflation rate first, knowing that it's something expansionary causes inflation. So if I cover these up and look right here, 10% and 10%, those are two bad situations, aren't they? Those would make you reluctant to do anything expansionary. So then once I'm down to these two, I go, okay, well, at 10% unemployment, I might have to do it anyways to get out of that recession. So I would be a little less reluctant when we have 10% unemployment. 10% unemployment is like 2008 when we had the financial crisis. 10, 11, 12%, we had to do stuff. So we dropped the Fed funds rate to zero and the discount rate to zero in 2008 after that crisis. Okay, that was extremely aggressive. But no one was borrowing, everyone was broke, everyone was scared, okay? All right, so this is kind of ugly, but once you, remember what I always, always say, go with what you know and then try and solve from there, okay? So, that makes sense now? All right. Okay, number 58. This is kind of a frustrating one because of the little pieces and parts that they throw at you. All right, so assume Jane's NPC is 0 0.8. In 2004, she spent 36,000 from her disposable income of 40 grand. So in 2004, she was making 40,000 a year, wasn't she? In 2005, she gets a raise up to 50 grand per year. That's a pretty nice raise. Her consumption spending increased by how much? Okay. So if she spends 80% of her income and she gets a $10,000 raise, simply take her disposable income change, and you can think of it like this, her change in income went up by 10,000, didn't it? So if she's gonna save 20%, how much is she gonna spend now? 8,000 bucks. So the answer is 8,000. This was a distractor they threw in, the 36000 okay? So you have to look at all of her income first, and then do your MPC and MPS, all right? So simply, she can spend $8,000 more. It feels like a complicated question, but it just takes reps, okay? It takes repetition or practice reading through these things, all right? Everybody good? Any questions about that? Okay. All right, number 59. Advocates of a monetary rule recommend increasing the money supply at a rate that is equal to the rate of increase in which of the following. Okay, 
This is what the monetary rule is. I'm sure it's one of those small things I've said during monetary policy day. Monetary rule means simply this, okay? We have to have money to match what we spend in our economy, okay? Taylor, you guys with, with me? Okay, monetary rule. If we grow by 3%, there are 3% more are new jobs, aren't there? Growth means jobs that never existed. Brand new GDP. So if our economy grows at 3%, we have to print some more money, don't we? Because all of a sudden there's a new job that never got a paycheck. Now they get a paycheck for the first time. If they want to go cash it, if there's no cash there, if everyone cashes their paycheck on Paycheck Friday, and now all of a sudden there are new jobs, we're short cash, aren't we? So the monetary rule means the Federal Reserve Bank needs to grow the money supply at the same rate as our economy. Okay? We simply need money to facilitate the transactions that are born with that growth. So what we're looking at is long run real GDP. That's associated to growth, isn't it? So long run growth, remember we have this right here. Long run aggregate supply, this is how much GDP we have. So if we're at 20 trillion and we grow to 21 trillion, we need more money, don't we? We need a trillion more dollars to keep up, okay? So answer is E, monetary rule. Okay, number 60, if economic agents perfectly anticipate policy changes and if all prices, including wages, are completely flexible, which of the following will be true in the long run? Okay, this part right here, wages being flexible. If it's a recession and you lost your job and you were making 12 bucks an hour, you do need to be flexible on your wage if you want a job. Well, think about this. In a recession, employers have the upper hand, don't they? Because guess what? Don't people need a job? And if they walk in and give you a resume and they're like, hey, I am really good at this job. I need $15 an hour. And you go, well, here is the rest of the pile of resumes and they all want eight bucks an hour because that's what I'm offering. Do you need to be flexible? Yes, okay? So in the long run, there's no trade-off between inflation and unemployment because people are gonna get a job, aren't they? Okay? So what I mean by that, these economic agents, they anticipate policy changes. So if you're an economic agent, which means you're looking at the economy, you work for the Federal Reserve, you work for the president, whatever, okay? you say, okay, well, we're gonna have some policy changes coming up. We're about to do a massive tax cut. What might that do? Okay? So, in the long run though, if there's inflation, do you need a job? Yes, okay? So there's no trade-off right there. Price level being constant, if there's policy changes happening, price level won't be constant, okay? The unemployment rate will be less than the natural rate, we don't know what the policy changes are, do we? Okay, unemployment rate will be greater than the natural rate, no. Changes in the money supply will not lead to changes in the price level. That's not true, they're independent of each other, okay? So, quite a few complicated things. Just remember in the long run, if there's inflation, you still need a job, don't you? And you need to be flexible on your wages. So do your employers, okay?